You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Somehow I whistled in there, and it was I almost it almost derailed the whole thing because I couldn't stop thinking about the whistle. <laughs> was like, that? Was like Winnie the Pooh? Is there like a beaver that keeps whistling when he says the the uh, the old S letter? I'm going to get some soup. Can't even do it when I try to do it. But today is game day, ladies and gentlemen. Green Bay Packers at the Baltimore Ravens. Um, I I don't want to phrase that. Well, maybe I do. I don't want to phrase this as because I've done this so many times already this year. But I guess that's what you do when your team is the better team a lot. It's not so much that it's a must-win game, although we're kind of in that territory every week right now. It's it's sort of a must-win game from the standpoint of come on, man. <laughs> like <laughs> this isn't even a football team right here. First of all, if we can just revisit something for a minute here. The Baltimore Ravens have not won a game since November 28th against the Cleveland Browns when they won 16 to 10, okay? The week before that, they beat the Bears 16 to 13. So, kudos to their defense for saving them from utter embarrassment. But they're two of their last 3. And again, they're 0 for 2 the last 2 weeks. Since their last win, they lost star cornerback Marlon Humphrey for the entire season. That was December 5th we got that news. Lamar Jackson seems to be completely out. From what I can tell, it sounds like um, Tyler Huntley's going to play. I'll give you that audio in just a second. And now, as of 10 hours ago from 6 in the morning, Ravens wide receiver Sammy Watkins is being placed on reserve COVID list, and he's out versus the Packers. But um, here is the latest as of, you know, again, from where I'm at in time on Lamar Jackson actually playing in this game. Not a very good chance for Lamar Jackson to get on the field on Sunday. No one I've spoken with has ruled him out specifically, but certainly it is looking like Tyler Huntley is going to be the starter for the Baltimore Ravens. Lamar Jackson dealing with a low ankle sprain, but seemed to be a pretty significant one, one that really blew up on him after that hit right there was taken out of the game did not return. He was not able to practice at all this week. And my understanding, as it stands right now, is that it is likely that Tyler Huntley is the starter for the Baltimore Ravens against the Packers. So they lost their starting quarterback. They lost one of their wide receivers. Obviously not their most impactful one, but it would be, you know, I don't know, similar to us. Eh, I guess kind of like Lazard, but not really. I don't know. There's, There's not really a good comp here. They lost Ronnie Stanley at left tackle. Alejandro Villanueva came in. He's questionable for this game. At left guard, they had uh, Ben Cleveland. Ben Cleveland became Ben Powers, and Ben Powers is now out of this game. The right tackle was Villanueva before he moved to left tackle, which became Makari, but then Makari got hurt, and then Tyree Phillips took over, and then Tyree Phillips got hurt. They're both injured. We're not sure which of the two. Maybe both are going to play. I don't know. Maybe neither. I'll keep an eye on that as time rolls along. They lost their top two running backs and now have Devontae Freeman and uh, Latavius Murray, which anytime you see Latavius Murray, you know you're on a team that's uh, struggling at running back. Not No diss against Latavius. I've always liked Lat- Latavius, but that's his role right now in football. Latavius' job is to get picked up when um, we don't have like a number two. And then he usually ends up becoming the number one at one point, doing a pretty good job and then getting, you know, scrapped so that somebody else can pick him up as a number two somewhere. On the defensive line, it used to be uh, Derek Wolf, Brandon Williams, and Calais Campbell. Derek Wolf went on IR. Calais Campbell is doubtful for this game uh, with a thigh injury. At corner, it used to be Marcus Peters and Marlon Humphrey. They're both gone, so now they have Anthony Averett and Jimmy Smith. By the way, in addition to Sammy Watkins, Chris Westry, who is a corner, also added to the reserve COVID list, so he's out. At safety, they started the season with Deshaun Elliott and Chuck Clark. Deshaun Elliott is on IR, Chuck Clark, COVID IR for this week. So both of their corners, both of their safeties, gone. I mean, we're dealing with injury too, but I mean, they just... It's a rough situation, man, and if this is a playoff team, if this is a Super Bowl team... 
they should be able to go on the road and beat the Baltimore Ravens. Tyler Huntley throw into Hollywood Brown with a banged up offensive line, um, a street free agent running back because all their running backs got hurt. The number one player on their defense is Calais Campbell. He may not be playing in this game. He's one of the few people on this entire team that has a good run defense grade. So the, the one guy that could blow up our whole plan to run the ball against this smash and, and smash and pound? No, we're not going there. Uh, you know, you don't have the, they, they're a physical football team. So running the ball for us might be a decent idea. Although, considering they have no corners, you could also throw at them. Maybe, maybe a balanced approach. It, it kind of, I don't know that it matters. I mean, just, just there's, there's three players on their entire team. Tell me if these names sound familiar. Three players that have a 70 or higher run defense grade. Chris Westry, Calais Campbell, Deshaun Elliott. Does that sound familiar? It should, because I literally just said all of their names. Chris Westry, I think, is on COVID IR. Deshaun Elliott is on IR. Calais Campbell is doubtful to play in this game. Granted, two of them are DBs, but you got a safety, a corner, and a defensive lineman. Calais Campbell is also their... Um, fourth best pass rusher with 28 pressures on the season. It's not great, but it's still something, and it's a pretty big blow for them. I mean, I, I aside from a couple good pass rushers, I don't know what it is that this team is doing right now to keep people from scoring. Is that it? They just, they just rush the passer really well, or what? And by really good, I mean, like, adequate. Uh, Jason Owe, now apparently known as Odafe Owe, uh, 11%. So that's fine. Five sacks. Tyus Bowser's kind of killing it, but the guy's really freaking weird. He's a defensive tackle who is one of the best coverage guys on their team. Um, he's like 242 pounds. He plays defensive end, like interior defensive line. He has a 14.7% pressure rate, six sacks, and a 76 coverage grade. 58 run defense grade, probably because he's really small and plays defensive tackle. Here's an idea. If he lines up on the defensive line, run at him. I don't know. It's it's a weird freaking team, man. For example, if you look at their best coverage grades, um, Owe, Jason Owe, the edge rusher, is number one with a 90 coverage grade. So he drops into coverage a lot, apparently doing a great job. Kevin Seymour, who's a, safe, a corner that never plays. Justin freaking Houston, another edge rusher that's like 500 years old. Tyus Bowser, the defensive lineman. Brandon Williams, the defensive lineman. Josh Bynes, the linebacker. Calais Campbell, the defensive lineman. He's only done it once, but still, we're going by grades here. Geno Stone, who's a safety that hardly ever plays. Pernell McPhee, another edge rusher. Kristen Welch, a linebacker. Marlon Humphrey, who is no longer playing. And then you get to Jimmy Smith, all the way down here to 12th. The 12th best coverage guy is the only guy that actually plays in a coverage role. 62.4 62.4 overall grade. I think the only thing Baltimore really has to hang their hat on here is their home record. Um, on the road is when they've really been struggling, although on the road has been also recent. But anyways, they're still 5-1 and one at home, including their most recent uh, Week 12 and Week 9 victories over the Cleveland Browns and the Minnesota Vikings. There is one major problem here, though. I, I would be much more scared... If um, they won these home games by dominating on defense, they really don't. The Cleveland Browns game was a, you know, 10 points given up by the defense. Also, week six against the Chargers, they only gave up six. Their other games, though, 25 to the Colts, 31 to the Vikings, 35 to the Chiefs, and 41 to the Bengals. That one they lost, by the way. But the defense has been kind of terrible at home. Most of their really good games uh, defensively, 17 points to the Lions, that was on the road. 7 points to the Broncos, that was on the road. 22 to Miami on the road. 13 to Chicago was on the road. 20 to the Steelers was on the road. 24 to Cleveland was on the road. The only game they gave up a bunch of points on the road was to the Raiders in overtime, 33 points. So they've been winning a lot at home because they've been scoring a ton of points at home. 34 points against the Vikings, 34 against the Chargers, 31 against the Colts, 36 against the Chiefs. But they don't have Lamar. Are we saying Tyler Huntley is going to score 34 points in this game? I mean, technically, Tyler Huntley did play against the Chargers when they scored 34, but um, Tyler Huntley came in and ran three times for 10 yards is what Tyler Huntley did. 
Lamar Jackson was 19 of 27, 167 yards and a touchdown, as well as eight rushing attempts for 51 yards. He was the one playing in that game. His biggest win <clears throat> win was against Chicago, 16 to 13, when he was 26 of uh, 36 for 219 yards, zero touchdowns and a pick. This is the guy, by the way, that everybody's screaming is actually a really, really good quarterback. He might be better than Lamar. I just weird. To, I don't understand this fascination with these undrafted free agent, nobody quarterbacks coming in. And if they're just not horrible, suddenly they're the next coming of this great. When has that ever happened outside of like Tom Brady? When has that ever happened? That never happens. Every, every time, right? Whether it's Minshew, who's that guy in Washington that had like a really good playoff game and everybody thought he was the next coming of, of whatever. And then next year he starts and he's just trash and gets replaced. Everybody freaked out because he was 27 of 38 for 270 yards and a touchdown in a game that they lost 22 to 24 to the Cleveland Browns. I'm sorry. It's not that impressive. First of all, he threw the ball 38 times. Aaron Rodgers has only done that twice. He threw the ball 39 times against Cincinnati and 45 times against LA. He didn't throw 200 some odd yards though. The one time he threw somewhere near that 39 times, he threw for 344 yards. Actually, his game against Seattle is pretty similar. 37 attempts, 292, zero touchdowns and a pick. <laughs> but that was a bad game. It's kind of, kind of my point. So look, at the, at the end of the day, and this has kind of been a constant thing for me throughout the entire season, it, this whole game hinges on, you know, I guess I have to say special teams. Special teams and our offensive line. The only way, and I, again, I've said this every week. Every time I go on somebody's show and they're like, I don't know how we're going to beat the Packers. What can we do? You have to get pressure on Rodgers. They have some decent pass rushers, and you know our offensive line has done a good job, but they're also an offensive line that you could see them having a bad day, and, and you would just think, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Like this guy, whose name I learned five seconds ago, um, struggled against a pretty good pass rusher. Yeah, that that I, I, I get that. Like if Dennis Kelly had a bad day, would we all just be like, I can't believe it. The guy who couldn't start over Billy Turner had a bad day blocking. That's crazy. I didn't think that would happen ever. But if they're able to block, I just don't know. I mean, who's going to shut down Devontae? Who's going to stop Aaron Rodgers? Alan Lazard is starting to get into a little bit of a groove. Mercedes Lewis is doing his thing. DeGuara is starting to come around in a big way as a blocker and as a receiver. With their number one run defender out, I, I have to assume we're going to have... By the way, I guess I'll finish the thought. I, I have to assume we're going to run the ball well. But here's, here's a thought also. You know what's going to make me happy in this game? Do you remember the Arizona Cardinals game, what our game plan was in that game? How many times can I say game in a sentence, you think? I'll try to beat that record someday, but not, not at this moment. Our game plan in that game was, this is a really fast, fly-around-the-field kind of a defense, and so we're not going to try to race them. We're not going to beat them in a foot race. We're going to smash them right in the mouth. I'm not saying Baltimore is necessarily Arizona, but their number one linebacker is who? It's my favorite guy in the world. You remember? Patrick Queen. It's a guy that most Packer fans really wanted us to draft. According to Baltimore Ravens fans, he's having a great year, flying around the field, just doing magical things. Patrick Queen is six foot one, 227 pounds, and he runs really, really fast. Do you think for one second I want to take Aaron Jones and try to get him around the outside against Patrick Queen? Absolutely, I do not. You know what I want to do? I want to take A.J. Dillon, and I want to smash him right in Patrick Queen's front two teeth. He's six foot one, 227 pounds. He has a 47 run defense grade, a 52 tackling grade. By the way, 39 coverage grade. So he's not really doing anything well aside from pass rush, which is what most of these guys are doing. Most of these linebackers are not doing anything. Technically, he is getting better, though. He had a 29 overall grade last year. That's up to a 42. His 29 run defense grade is a 47. His 34 tackling grade is now a 52. And his 30 coverage grade is now a 39. So kudos. He is the second lowest graded defender on their entire defense. But again, they love him. Why? Because he's so athletic. Because he can, and, and he has some good games. He had a 90 overall grade against the Chargers, an 82 overall grade against Cincinnati, an 82 overall grade against Miami. Occasionally, I think if you play to his strengths, he can really show up. But I don't want to play to his strengths. I don't want to play those stupid games anymore like we did against Tampa when we tried to run to the outside. But they have Levante David who runs blaze it with blazing speed and can race us to the side and, and just take our guy out. Remember, we kept trying to get around the outside against fast linebackers and it didn't work. Don't do that. If we can create a crease for A.J. Dillon to run through, the next line of defense is Patrick Queen. In fact, the whole point of getting a guy like Patrick Queen typically 
is to let the guy run free so that he can make the play. Everybody else needs to get in, get hat on a hat, and he's the one that's going to run free so he can take the guy out. Cool. Let's do that. Let's play that game. I want to play that game. I want to play that game all day. Six foot one, two twenty seven against AJ Dillon. Best of luck to you. Patrick Queen is ranked sixty sixth out of eighty five linebackers. By the way, Devin White is seventy sixth. He's one of the worst in football. Uh, Devin Bush was another guy that a lot of Packer fans wanted. Eightieth. All these first round linebackers that everybody loves are always horrible. They're always just the worst. You know what else is funny? If you sort by run defense grade. He has a 47 run defense grade, which is horrible. He's 48th out of 85. He's kind of average. Linebackers, I swear, this, and, and I think this is why a guy like A.J. Dillon is so valuable. All of the linebackers that are coming out right now are these smaller, faster guys, and they're all horrible. Only 23 linebackers in the NFL have a 60 grade as far as run defense or higher. That's it. 23 out of 85. Only 11. These are linebackers. Remember remember back in the day when linebackers, your whole job was to be really good at stopping the run? That was like a major part of your job. Only 11 have a 70 overall grade or higher. Only four, Devondre Campbell is one of them, has a 80 overall grade or higher. Only one, Alexander Johnson in Denver, has a 90 overall grade against the run. Linebackers as run defenders. Good Lord. Pass rushers, though, oh man, we got some pass rushers. 60 out of 85 have a 60 overall grade. Most of them do quite well. 70 overall grade, you got 19. 19 different guys with 70 overall grades. So again, this is why the A.J. Dillons, I think, are going to start to make a comeback. This is why you're going to see what the Colts are doing with Jonathan Taylor, what the Texans or what the Titans are doing with uh, Derrick Henry, what the Packers are doing with A.J. Dillon. You're going to bolster that offensive line. You're going to bring in a 250-pound smash-mouth running back, and you're just going to bully these these little, tiny, speedy, you know, guys that are developed to stop mobile quarterbacks and, like, Le'Veon Bell. You know, this whole waiting patiently behind the the, the line of scrimmage, the, the getting around the outside, outside zone, you know, racing to the sideline type stuff. Even wide receiver screen, you know, all these different things that are that are meant to go laterally. I mean, the the whole West Coast offense, right, from sideline to sideline. These guys just race around and they blow all that stuff up. And they do a really good job at that. And we've seen that because that's what the Packers wanted to do for a long time. And these kinds of linebackers just destroyed us. But now we've got a little bit of a different trick up our sleeve. When we come up against these kinds of guys, and granted, it's it's not just one guy that you got to worry about. I mean, if they've got a tough defensive line, maybe it's still not going to work anyways. But if they don't, if this is primarily what you do is you try to stop these speedy, you know, smaller running backs, you know, no offense to Aaron Jones, but this is not his matchup. Not that he can't do it, but it's just, it's a much, if you can get a situation where A.J. Dillon is hat on a hat with a guy like Patrick Queen, dude, that's just, come on, man. L- let me ask you this. His lowest run defense grade, I'm just going to throw out a couple teams here. Do you think it was against Miami, Chicago, um, Detroit, Pittsburgh, or Indianapolis? It was Indianapolis. It was his lowest run defense grade, 27.0. You know what his best run defense grade was? It was against the Miami Dolphins. You know who their number one carrier was in week 10? Miles Gaskin. Miles Gaskin is 5'10", 193. You get it? Their other running back is Salvin Ahmed, 5'11", 196. Those are their running backs. Patrick Queen lit them up. These are fast, agile, run around in circle type, type running backs. They didn't do well against Patrick Queen. Not that they do really well against anybody, but Jonathan Taylor, 5'11", 221. Now, to be fair to Baltimore, he still didn't do very well against Baltimore. It's still a tough team to run against, but the point is, I think that's what you end up doing. I think that ends up being your strength. And I have a feeling that's what we're going to end up doing a lot of today. That is, you know, when we run the ball, because again, um, this is a defense that is pretty bad against the pass and is down a bunch of DBs and we have Aaron Rodgers and Devontae Adams. So probably a lot of passing. But again, when we run, I think it's gonna be a heavy dose of AJ Dillon. And I just I just I just hope it works. You know what I mean? If it doesn't, then you get into that situation where I think the Packers are really gonna want to throw all the time because the advantage is so strong in their favor. And if if you know you start forcing it, it doesn't matter who you're playing, it just starts to get ugly. But if it's working and you can just kind of do whatever you want, it's game over. So I, I think it's important that we can run the ball well. 
as much as, you know, coming into the game plan, most people are going to say, just throw it, dude. Yeah, I get that. But you got to be able to run the ball. You got to be able to threaten. You got to be able to slow the pace. You got to be able to grind out a drive. I just want to see it working. And again, it's going to be important because this is technically one of the better run defense teams, despite, you know, again, if Calais Campbell is out, that makes a big difference in in what version of this defense you're getting. Anyways, the, the, the Packers outmatch the Baltimore Ravens in, in sort of every capacity. Now, that's not to say that it's they're so bad it's kind of a trap game. I don't think so. I think considering it's on the road, it's an uncommon opponent, um, you know, the, the how close we are to the playoffs, I, I think we're kind of out of trap game territory because of how serious every game is and the implications of every game and trying to stay ahead of the pack as far as winning the NFC. I think they understand uh, the reputation of the team, the record of the team, uh, the tenacity of the defense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a concern as far as the the Packers not taking it seriously, but they're the better team and they need to show up and they need to be the better team. And, And again, obviously the special teams is a massive concern. I mean, if we do what we did last week, which is continually give them short fields, if they start at the 40 yard line every time and we're starting at like the 10 yard line and, you know, throw in a couple of points here and there because we allow them to get a kick return or we fumble a, a punt return or whatever the case may be, suddenly it becomes a game. But I think if special teams can just be adequate, just don't be the worst thing ever. I want Mason Crosby to do his absolute best. And if he can't do it, find somebody who can kick that thing out of the end zone. Just admit if they can start at the 25, I trust the defense. Just make him start at the 25. I'm fine with that every single time. I just think he can't do it because there's no way our special teams... Co- I shouldn't say that. Who knows what he's telling them to do. But I would say there's no way they're telling him to kick it to the one, right? Or, you know, within two yards of the... However far in, they're willing to take it out, which is probably pretty far considering the special teams unit they're going up against. But I'm really just not asking for much. Just just don't be awful. If we could start even around like the 20 and they could start at the 25, I'll take that. And I think we win the game just flat out. But if you give a team a handicap where they have 20 less yards to go to score touchdowns and field goals, that's, I mean, it's just, it's a massive advantage in a game. But anyways, uh, why don't we take a break? We're going to come back, look at a few of these other games. I'll give my score prediction for the Packers Ravens, as well as some of these other games. I don't know about score prediction necessarily, but we'll talk through them, the implications and how important they all are. Um, If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. There are some other options. If you'd really like to know, you can reach out. Otherwise, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. All right, I guess we can start off with the Carolina Panthers and the Buffalo Bills. 
Again, not really much to see here. The Buffalo Bills should be able to steamroll the Carolina Panthers. They are 13-point favorites. I'm really just looking for Buffalo to look a little bit flat, not even necessarily lose the game again. It's really just, I just want to see good teams look bad. Speaking of, by the way, um, New England Patriots, as I've said, have been a pretty scary team for a while now. Kudos to the Colts for just completely putting the kibosh on that. Needed to see that because that team was just rolling. So at some point, I might take a closer look and see what exactly happened there. But um, with that being done, you start to shift your focus to the red hot Kansas City Chiefs and wonder if maybe they're back on top, which at this point I'm fine with. I just don't want the Patriots to come back to life. But uh, not really much to see here. It doesn't have any direct implications to us. The Buffalo Bills are really probably not going to. If they do, that's glorious. I mean, it really is. It's one of those can't lose situations. If Buffalo wins, they're expected to win. If Carolina wins, that's just amazing. Uh, Jets and Dolphins, nobody cares. Dallas and the Giants, kind of the same thing. It's sort of frustrating that so many teams get so many gimmies uh, down the stretch here. We really need some some big things for Tampa and Dallas and whatnot. And you just you get these gimmies, and it's just kind of annoying. But again, you never know. It's a divisional game between the Giants and the Cowboys. We'll see what happens. Dallas has been somewhat less than impressive since basically their bye week. Kind of similar to Baltimore, actually. went Started 5-1 and one and have been kind of iffy ever since. Uh, losing pretty handily to the Denver Broncos. That was right after barely beating the Minnesota Vikings. Um, they smashed Atlanta, and then they lose to Kansas City, only scoring 9 points. They lose to the Raiders, 33-36. Um, they beat the Saints by 10, and then they beat Washington by 7. So, again, fully expect them to beat the Giants, but... I don't know. I, 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 it's kind of probably the same thing as Buffalo. They're going to win, but I just want them to not dominate, I guess. Because that is one of the nightmare scenarios, is getting to the NFC Championship with Dallas and having um, the Dallas Cowboys and Mike McCarthy get to the Super Bowl by stepping on our head. That would just be one of the worst possible scenarios. There's a lot of bad scenarios out there. Tennessee Titans, Pittsburgh Steelers don't really care. I kind of just, it's you know, again, just would like to see them look not great. Texans Jaguars battle of the uh, battle of the draft position for that game would be interesting to see if Jacksonville gets a little bit more life in that game having lost their head coach I would bet they do I bet they win that game Arizona Cardinals against Detroit I mean you know again I don't know I don't really know what to say about that we need Arizona to to lose and they get one of the easiest games they could possibly get I'd love to buy into the whole scrappy Lions thing maybe there's a chance maybe it's a trap game kind of situation I just I don't think there's much hope here 49ers Falcons is another team I'd love to not be in the playoffs is the 49ers as of right now if you just go based on win percentage and what you you know what team if every team that's expected to win wins San Francisco will be in the playoffs with the seventh seed over the Minnesota which I guess is fine I mean if it's going to keep Minnesota out I guess I'll tolerate it that's kind of a win-win I guess if the 49ers win it hurts Minnesota if the 49ers lose it hurts the 49ers so that's it's all good news. Cincinnati and Denver, I just, I don't know. I wish I could find a reason to care. I just don't care. Packers and Baltimore, Packers are seven-point favorites. I don't know, man. I mean, if we look at the games they've won, which is most of them, they beat Seattle by 17, Arizona by 3, Washington by 14, Chicago by 10, uh, Cincinnati by 3, Pittsburgh by 10, San Fran by 2, Um 18, 8, I mean, most of them are by more than 7. I think they're going to win by more than 7. I'm tempt- I'm not going to bet on the Packers because that's just bad juju, but I would I would say that that would be the right bet. I mean, to be completely honest, they, they have not played. The only team they've played since their bye week with a winning record is the Cleveland Browns, um, and they went 1-1 one one against the Cleveland Browns, and the Cleveland Browns are 7-6. and six. They barely have a winning record. Um before that, they played Cincinnati. Again, technically winning record at 7-6. and six. They lost that game. Prior to that, that's when they, they actually looked like a competent team. So I, I just, yeah, I, I, score prediction. I'll give them the whole home field advantage thing, even though they shouldn't. But let's, let's bump up what I initially had said that they're going to get. Plus, it seems like every game recently has been the Packers not, especially the defense. The defense has given up a lot, or, or defense slash special teams. The Packers have given up a lot more points than expected recently. 34 to Minnesota, 28 to the Rams, and 30 to Chicago. That's kind of crazy. How about 22-30? Yeah, no, no, there's going to be a couple field goals in there. 22-31. How about that? Uh, New Orleans Saints, Tampa Bay Buccaneers is the late game. Um, 
absolutely, definitely, 100% need the uh, Saints to win that game. Not a big Saints fan, but man, do we need something big from the Saints. The stupid Buccaneers have won four in a row, including beating Buffalo in overtime. Um, they haven't had the best matchups. I mean, there was the there was the Buffalo game. Indy's not a terrible team, but uh, otherwise it was the Giants and the Falcons. And the last time they played the Saints, they did lose to the Saints, 36 to 27. Um, so, although this one is going to be in Tampa, still just really, 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 really need that to happen. But that's about it, man. We got uh, we got some what Tuesday games too. Today's the 19th, so the 20th. I thought there were Tuesday games. Yeah, so Monday is Cleveland and Las Vegas, and then Chicago and Minnesota, which just man, do I want to watch that game. Too bad it's Monday at 7.15, so I'm going to watch about 10 minutes of it and go to bed. So crazy. We got Saturday games. We got early Monday games, 4 o'clock, which is, is that for my time? Yeah, 4 o'clock Central time on a Monday. So that's right when I get home. Man, I wish the Bears-Vikings were when I got home. Then we got Tuesday at 6. We have two games at 6 p.m. That's just weird. But Philadelphia and Washington, and then L.A. and Kansas City, And then two days later, we have Thursday, which is 49ers-Titans. Then two days later, we have, well, Christmas, where we'll have the Packers and the Browns and the Cardinals and the Colts, and then Sunday, and then Monday. (laughs) It's just, it's a lot of football, man. And we get an extra week of football, so it's not even like, well, you know, then there's only one more week. No, man, we got week 17. Unfortunately, there's no Saturday or any crazy stuff. In fact, there's no Thursday either, so it's... All Sunday games and then uh, one Monday game. And week 17 is even in January. So we're in January and we got two weeks left. So weird. I remember January used to just be, that was just playoffs. So we got January 9th. We got Packers, Lions, and a bunch of games. And they're all Sunday. There's no Saturday. There's not even a Monday. So it is a Sunday marathon. There are 12 noon games and then one, two, three, four afternoon games. And that's it. There's not there's no night games, there's no Thursday game, there's no nothing. So they're they're getting everybody in and out of here and going home. Then we get to sit and stew until the playoffs. Which by the way, again, if 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 everybody that's expected to win wins, the way that the playoffs are seeded right now, the Green Bay Packers are the number one seed, Tampa's number two, Arizona's number three, Dallas is number four. LA is number five, New Orleans is number six, San Francisco is number seven. So we would get home field advantage and a bye week. Um, The San Francisco 49ers would travel to Tampa Bay. Um, We would assume Tampa would win that game, but who knows. The New Orleans Saints would travel to Arizona, probably going to be an Arizona thing. And then LA would travel to Dallas. That one's a little bit more up in the air. We'll see what happens. But we would get, as the number one seed, the lowest seeded team that wins comes to Green Bay. So it would not be Tampa. The only way it would be Tampa is if, or it wouldn't be Tampa, but the only way we would play anybody of this game is if San Francisco won. If San Francisco wins, they come to Green Bay automatically. If San Francisco doesn't win, then it would be the Saints. If the Saints don't win, it would be the Rams. And then after that, it would be Dallas. So we will not see Arizona or Tampa Bay. If the San Francisco 49ers do lose, Washington takes that spot. And bear in mind, this is assuming Minnesota wins. So they're they're so far out of this right now that they would need, uh, let's see, if Washington, I have Washington winning, so if Washington loses, then it's, <laughs> then the Saints become the number one, uh, the number seven seed. The Eagles go to the number six seed because they would have to beat Washington. So that's the problem is, okay, Washington loses, so that should bump up Minnesota. The problem is, what really happens is the Eagles have to win, which bumps them to the six seed, which moves New Orleans to the seven seed. And you say, well, what if the Saints lose? Well, if this, the Saints already are planning to lose against Tampa. <laughs> So there's really nothing that can happen this week that would bump um, anything around too much as far as Minnesota getting into the playoffs. If Tampa Bay loses, which would be great, it doesn't change a ton other than obviously our number one seed is more secure, but it really just switches. Arizona becomes the number two seed, which again is, is great because we can be tied with Arizona and still have that number one seed. Um, if we tie with... Actually, that's not true because we're tied with Tampa here, and we're the number one seed. Anyways, again, it, for our sake, we just got to win out. That's it. If we do end up losing this game, we would actually fall to the number three seed because Dallas is 
Dallas is a team that beats us in a tiebreaker. So Tampa takes the number one seed, which makes me sick. Again, assuming they win. Dallas, assuming they beat the Giants, which is a fair assumption. Uh, they would be the number two seed. We would be the number three seed in this scenario. Um, and if we go back to Washington having won that game, we would have New Orleans coming to Green Bay. God, I just knew it, man. I knew it would be something like that, where that one team, I just, I can't handle that. I know it shouldn't matter because the Saints are not the same Saints and they're not very good and we should be able to beat them, but it just it's just a weird thing, man. I, I can't get past the superstition of it. I don't want them, although I don't want Tampa either. And I'm kind of scared of San Francisco for that reason. And I'm terrified of Dallas because I just don't want Dallas to beat us in the playoffs. And Arizona is an NFC West team and NFC West teams always scare us in the playoffs. I think the only team I want to face is the Rams. That's it. And I don't even want to face the Rams. I'm scared of the Rams. I'm scared of everybody because I don't want to lose because I just, <laughs> I can't handle it. But we seem to beat the Rams, so that would be fine. We, it would probably be fine to face the Vikings, too, if they were able to actually get back into the playoff race. But that's seeming less and less likely at this point. So I don't know, man. Just trust the process. And, and again, that when, we, when you look at it from this standpoint, if we just think about playoff football today, I don't want to say that if we don't beat the Ravens, that means we'll never win in the playoffs, because that's not necessarily how that works. But if this is a playoff team, that's going to be able to beat the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the playoffs. That's going to be able to beat Dallas and Arizona in 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 whether it's in Lambeau or on the road. Let's just pretend it's not. Let's pretend this is. Let hey, this is the Super Bowl. Baltimore Ravens, Green Bay Packers on the road. What are you going to do? Let's see what they can do. By the way, it is 42 degrees in Baltimore today, which is uh, compared to Wisconsin, it's not that bad. 42 is not that bad. Granted, we just had 60 not too long ago, but we're we're back into the 30s, so 42 is is not bad. Uh, wind is 14 miles an hour with 22 mile an hour wind gusts. That's uh, it's a little breezy, but not the worst. So, anyways, that's all I got, man. The Packers are the. I mean, it's, it's going to be the same story every week. The Packers are the better team. Let's see if they can just show up and and not shoot themselves in the foot. That's all they got to do. If they if they can just continue playing without shooting themselves in the foot, looking right at you, special teams, they're going to win out. They're going to get the number one seed, and we can start focusing on uh, what to do from there. But go pack, go! I'll talk to you tomorrow for hopefully victory Monday. Have a good one. Bye bye.